You can go ahead and have a seat. And he broke the string, so we're gonna make some adjustments here. That's what hey. we do. We walk in flexibility, but can I get my testimony? That's what I was getting ready to say is we have a testimony, so this is good. Great, okay. Um, so I think sometimes when um, we think about testimonies, it has to be an earth shattering, like somebody raised from the dead or blind see or something like that. And, but this is just a tiny little testimony that y'all are gonna think are silly. You're gonna think it's silly, but you have to love me anyway. Um, so sometimes when I pray, I find myself, gosh, everybody left, where'd you wanna go? <laughs> um, I find myself praying prayers that will easily be answered, like, Dear Jesus, please let somebody tell me Happy Mother's Day today. <laughs> I mean, I'm a mother, it's Mother's Day, I'm pretty sure that's going to get answered. So, But there are some times that I pray prayers that there's not as good a likelihood that it will happen. And But it's, it was a pesky, silly little prayer. So this past Saturday was the Spring Blossom Parade. I'm a parade girl. I love a parade. I love a parade. And it was also senior day for Coley at his baseball game. Same exact time. I, I could not miss senior day, but I love a parade. But I'm not going to miss senior day because I love Cole Robert even more. So I was talking with my friend Julie about it this week, and I said, here's what I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that it rains just enough this week that the fields will be drenched and we can't play baseball, but it'll be a beautiful day on Saturday so that I can still go to the parade, but the game won't get canceled. So I won't miss senior day but I won't miss the parade either. And she's like, you know what, that is a brand new, I mean, the field is, the drainage is excellent. It's one of the best baseball fields in this area. And I was like, I don't know, but I feel so great. And so I was telling a friend at work, because we had a booth that, or a float that we were doing with work, which I hated to miss, but I wouldn't miss it because I love Cole Robert. But anyway, so I was telling a friend, I hate to miss the parade, but here's what I'm praying. I'm praying that it rains just enough that the fields will be flooded and we won't be able to play, but you know, it'll be a beautiful sunny day. And she said, that's a very specific prayer. And I said, you know what, babe? God loves specificity in prayer, it's okay. And don't you know, the game was canceled yesterday morning because the fields were flooded just enough that we couldn't play baseball. So I didn't miss Coley's senior night. I got to go to the parade. And you know, as I was walking down to the parade, I was like, I mean, like, I know it's stupid. It's the silliest little thing. But how crazy that <laughs> it didn't even rain that much this week, I don't think. But it rained just enough that the fields were flooded. And we could not play baseball yesterday morning, and I got to see the parade. And I'm not going to miss senior day. Isn't that, I mean, it's silly, but praise the Lord. And you know what? When I showed up to walk the parade, my friend from work, who I've been planting seeds along the way, she's like, you're here. And I said, yeah, the game got canceled. Look at that. She said, you are kidding me. <laughs> I said, no, I'm telling you, God loves for us to be specific. That was not a silly it was a silly thing. Listen, <laughs> God cares for each one of us. He really does. And um, the Lord told me to do something, so I guess I'm going to go ahead and be obedient. If that's all right with y'all. Yep. We, we do. We yeah. like obedience. Okay, so I need Brent Smith to come up here, if you would, please. <laughs> Hot seat. Yes. Have a seat, sir. Okay. And I need Jack with that to come up here, please. Now, you know, you might say, oh, why not me? Why not? The Lord showed me these two guys. So one of you needs to come on this side, and one of you needs to go on that side. All right. So here's what we're going to do. The Lord told me to pray for you, Brent, today for your healing. That um, you're going through some stuff right now, but you need to know that the Lord is with you. And his desire is for you to be whole, that you might do those things that are, he's got put right there before you. And so we're just going to pray for that pain to be gone. We're going to pray for alignment of your spine, your neck, your back, your shoulders, your hips, your knees, your ankles. Anybody else need something like that? <laughs> I just feel like there's more than one. You know what I'm saying? But we're going to pray over Brent right now. And um, 
just extend your hands towards him as an agreement in prayer. You, I mean, if you don't, you don't have to, but if you want to pray for Brent with me, then I want you to pray. All right, so Jack, I need you to lift up his right arm. Just lift it up about right there is good. <laughs> Left arm. Easy. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. Brent, are you ready for this? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just lift up Brent to you right now. And I know, Lord, that your desire is for him to be healed. And, Lord, you put it on my heart this morning. Just, I had an impression before I even talked to anybody. And then I started asking, and he's got some things going on. So I just want to pray from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, Lord, that your spirit will move on his body. Yes. Jesus, you are the great physician. And doctors can do what doctors can do, but Jesus can do a whole lot more. So we just lift up Brent to you right now. And it's, I'm having them raise up your arms, Brent, because it's like um, when you're in battle and you begin to get weary and you need people to come along and say, I got this. I'm with you. I can help you. So as these guys are holding up your arms, you need to understand that it's to allow the Holy Spirit to move on you and in you and through you. And we ask you, Lord, to move now in Jesus' name. Lord, anoint his head. I pray, Lord, that you would just bless this man right now. God, bring into alignment those things that are out of alignment. I pray, Lord, for any area that has damage, that has degeneration, according to the doctors, that we would speak life and regeneration in Jesus' name. That the, the uh, bones, that the, the uh, cartilage, that the, the uh, muscles, the tendons, everything around them, Lord, would begin to say yes to you, Lord. God, that they would come into alignment right now. I pray over his neck, Lord. God, that his, his neck comes into alignment. The rest of his body will follow along. I pray, Lord, right now over his shoulders, Lord. God, just like your oil falling over, over Aaron and, and dripping down, Lord, just let your Holy Spirit move over him right now in Jesus' name. Lord, that his shoulders, Lord, just strengthen his shoulders. And I ask, Lord, that this back would now come into alignment, Lord. God, that it's not because of a chiropractor. It's not because of a doctor. It's because of Lord Jesus touching this man even this morning. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, move on this body. And Lord, move, course through his body, course through his veins, Lord, with the power of the Holy Spirit in his body. We as believers have the Holy Spirit. We as believers have a portion. But Lord, I ask for more in Jesus' name. Flow over him, flow in him, flow through him. I pray, Lord, for encounter with you this morning, Lord, that your, this body would be touched. I pray for the hips to come into alignment. I pray for his knees to be strengthened, his ankles to be fully functional. God, that he can walk right and upright with you and straight. And God, that he would begin to walk fully in those things that you have before him. I know that in his spirit right now, Lord, that you're messing with him. You've been doing things to him. You've been drawing him close, Lord. And even now the enemy wants to come against and take down and destroy. But you, Lord, speak life, speak health. And we speak peace and joy over Brent right now. And I pray, Lord, that even as he gets up out of this chair, Lord, God, that we will know, that he will know that you're at, at work right now, that you're moving on this body. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring it to a fullness, a completion, a completion. He who began a good work in you, Brent, is faithful to complete it. And I ask you, Lord, to complete what you have already begun. In Jesus' name we say, amen. 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 Now, Brent, what's going on here? Anything? What's happening? Not sure about it. Okay. Well, I, I just want you to take in the words that were spoken. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to continue what He's begun. And we want to hear the reports of what He's doing. Because I know, I know that the Lord wants to heal you. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, brother. Guys, appreciate it. Now, I didn't even make him speak. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else that needs prayer? Does anybody else want to get prayed for? Y'all, I won't even put you in the hot seat. But if you need prayer this morning, you need to get with somebody and say, hey, that would be me. Because, you know, we don't want you to leave out of here not getting fully a, a hold of what God has for you this morning. Amen? Amen. Thanks. Amen. I love that. That's good stuff. You're like, wait, you're like, we'll release the kids in a second. I'm going to share a couple things. We are going to do communion, so if you didn't get communion, you should probably grab it. And uh, we're going to turn these lights on up here in a second. 
So prepare your eyes. So happy Mother's Day. Um, I want to I want to share just for just for a couple minutes about this because I, I believe that this day is a hard day. I believe that it is a day that is <clears throat> meant to be. Uh, full of celebration, but I think that the truth is is that it's full of a lot of uh, pain and disappointment and and, uh, and, and joy. And so I, I wrote some notes here, <clears throat> so just bear with me. A um, little history on Mother's Day, if you don't know this, Anna Jarvis is the one that originated it in, and make, on May 12, 1907. Um, actually, how she started it was she had a memorial service at her late mother's church in West Virginia. And uh, her mom, the reason why she wanted to honor her mom was her mother had organized women's groups to promote friendship and health. That was the purpose. It was, it was that her mom had this passion and desire of calling on her life uh, to bring other women in and to create the, the need for friendship and to be healthy and and it was such a good thing. Uh, within five years, virtually every state was observing the day. And in 1914, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson made a national holiday. The interesting thing, there's a couple of interesting things that I feel like. Um, she, when she, before she died, she spent the last years of her life trying to abolish the holiday as a protest against its commercialization. Yes. I think that's powerful. Because I think that when we look at this day, such a bit a lot of these holidays that someone had an intention right to honor a mom to honor what her mom was doing and the we've kind of taken out we get things out of balance right we get things out of balance um it said uh, uh, recognizing that not every woman gives birth to a child but but women have a maternal instinct that allows them to be motherly to all um i'm going to keep on going here so because I was going on and, and uh, you know, there are, there are a lot who, who struggle with um, fertility and struggle with having children or struggle or maybe they don't get married and so they don't have children. And, and, uh, and so there's a group called Auntie's Day. They created a thing called Auntie's Day because they're like, I'm a really good aunt. And, and the, real, the reality was it is, is when they looked at Anna Jarvis's life, she was... Um, she never got married and she never had children, but she was an incredible aunt, and she loved her nephews and nieces incredible. And so they started this thing, um, and it's for aunts and great aunts and godmothers and women who general offer their love to children, not their own, um, to be remembered on Mother's Day. It says um, they went on to say, babies are born from the womb, but maternity is born from the soul. There are many ways to mother. And I think that we need to remember that. I think it's important for us to remember that. Um, and so today, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some scripture. Uh, my message is not a Mother's Day message, but I did want to, I want us to recognize the women um, of God that we have in the house. I think it's important to recognize that, and you need to recognize the women of God that have been in your life. Um, we know Proverbs 31, right? It's a, it's a it's a famous passage that's used about uh, used for women and the character, godly, noble, or uh, noble character of women. Um, and when you when we read it, right, it, it actually the heading says it's a it's the noble character of a good wife, noble character of a wife. Um, but I would challenge us to not look at women as just mothers and a wife, um, but we would look at women as. Um, God ordained creatures and beings that are, are powerful and have um, have impact on our life. And so I am going to read through um, Proverbs 31, and then I have a couple other scriptures. It says, who can find a virtuous and capable wife? And I, I actually crossed out the word wife and put woman, because she is more precious than rubies. And a lot of times we put a label on a woman, but I don't know as a wife or as a mother or as this or that, but what if we just said who can find a virtuous and capable woman? Um, it also goes on to say her husband, I trust that I put mankind to trust her. She will greatly enrich their life, his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. Um, some of you do that. I don't think anybody does that anymore. But, um, 
Uh, huh? Someone does. Um, she is like a merchant ship bringing her food from afar. And um, food speaks a lot to, to when you're hurting or when you're down, right? So when someone <laughs> brings you food, man, that's, that's, that's a good thing. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household and plans the day's work for her servant girls. Um, she goes to inspect the field and buys it with her earnings, and she plants a vineyard. I think that as we read through this, a lot of this is hard for us to connect with because we don't do these things anymore. But if we would look at the heart of God and saying, my word that I've given to a man to write on in this Proverbs is to recognize, because you've got to remember in that culture, women were not recognized. Right? They, 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 did not have, they did not have a say. They, they were not um, valued. And yet God's word is saying, you need to value a woman who is a godly woman, a woman who chases after my heart. Um, she is energetic, strong, and a hard worker. And I'm going to tell you what, men know that, that women around us are energetic and strong and hard workers. Sometimes um, they remind us when we're not working hard. So um, she makes sure her, her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread. Her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear for a winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. She makes her own bedspread. She dresses in fine linen and purple gowns, you know, because they like to dress up like princesses. Um, her husband is well known at the city gates where he sits with other city leaders. That's because of what she does. She makes belted linen garments she, and sashes to sell to the merchants. She is clothed and, with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. And that's the one that normally we stick on is that she is clothed with strength and dignity, and she lacks dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise. She gives instructions with kindness. She, she, and that's the maternal thing right there. Because like with men, they're just like, dude, just get yourself together and do it. And women have this way of like smoothing it over and going, honey, you need to, you need to like not do that anymore, okay? <laughs> they just have this tender way of doing things. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand blessed, stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world but you surpass them all. And I, I believe that the Lord is saying that to you women. Indirect, I mean directly to you. There are many virtues, but you are Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly de declare her praise. And that's what we want to do. We want to say thank you to the women for being women of God. Thank you for being women who chase after the Father's heart. Philippians 1, 3 through 6 says this, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I will always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who be began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I've heard that scripture so many times today. Women, I want you to know that this world would crumble without you play on words because what we did for the women this year is we got you cookies. We got crumble cookies. They're called crumble cookies. And um, there's a couple things. At the end of service, you'll be able to get, you can go out and pick, there's five different flavors. You can pick two pretty big cookies. Uh, women 18 and over. And um, you can pick two. There's a spatula out there for, for you as well. And you're like, why a spatula? Well, you know, when I was growing up, the, the main thing about cookies was that the thing was always hot, and so the spatula was to get that thing that was hot onto a plate that I could enjoy, right? And so I think about a spatula, to me, that, that just really represented um, taking something that was good that I needed to get to me. And I believe that that's what women do a lot of times, is they take what is good of the Lord, and they are so good at getting it to people. And um, so I hope that every time you use that spatula, whether it's to um, whoop on some little kid who needs straightening out, um, we're okay, and we're okay with that. And, and, um, or if it's making cookies or doing something else, but I hope that every time you look at it, you will remember how important you are to God and how much he loves you and how much he appreciates you and how much he values you because you are important to him, you are important to us. 
So uh, let's give a blessing to the, to the women. Father, we thank you for the women of this house. Father, we thank you for the women that you have brought in. We thank you for the nature that you have given them, the traits that you have given them, the characteristics that you have passed on to them. Father, we thank you for them. And we ask that you would increase on them. Father, that you would you would display ways to let humanity appreciate and value the women that you created. Father, I thank you that in, in the beginning, when you created Adam, you said it is not good for mankind to be without a woman. When you created Eve, you brought Eve into the world. And so, Father, we thank you for that. We ask that you bless them. We ask that you increase upon them. Father, we ask that you would meet their emotional needs. Father, that you would, you would, uh, Holy Spirit, just be compassionate to hearts that are hurting today. Father, those that are facing and looking at disappointment, that you would bring wholeness to them. We love you and we bless you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, let's do communion. Mm -mm -mm. I'm going to read from my book today. Get your stuff ready while I read. John 17, 20 says, I do not pray for these only, but also for those who are to believe in me through their word. And the title of this one is For All Who Love Him. Um, here's what, this, is what, this is what he wrote. He said, we are met once more. We are, one, we are met once more by the table of the Lord. That's what we're doing right now. Following the customs of the early disciples, we met us on the first day of the week. In accordance with the practice of our brotherhood, we seek to make this service one in which all the followers of Christ may participate. It is our responsibility to set the table as our Lord requested. And I love that statement because I was thinking about it when Jesus said, go on in and prepare the, the meal. So right now what you're doing is preparing the meal. You're preparing the table. Right? How do we have a... How do we prepare the table? It is our responsibility that each of us, as followers in this presence, are to examine our hearts and thus to partake of the emblems. So I'd ask you right now to examine your heart. Do you have unforgiveness? Do you have something that you need to let go of, that the Lord has told us to let go of? In our plea for the union of his followers, we feel that eventually this communion table may become the center about which all Christians may unite. That time has not yet come, but that our Lord intended such communion to be for all who love him, there can be no doubt. And in the simple and beautiful service which our churches thus provide, we feel that we are truly making a contribution and realization of our plea in his prayer that they may all be one. Communion is a moment where we become one with each other and with the Lord. We are united in honoring the Lord. Sacred communion for all present and the fellowship with all who love Him all over the world today that we partake of the emblems of His broken body and His shed blood. So we take the body and we give thanks.
Today's title is No Participation Trophies. No Participation Trophies. I say that uh, with the next thing, you can, you can write this down next, is that um, God starts and finishes things. I believe that it is the characteristic of God to start and finish. Why do I say that? Because his word says that. His word declares who he is. And we can trust his word and we can live on his word. I already read it once, um, but I'm going to read it again. Philippians 6.1 And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. That tells me if we're made in God's image, that we are called to start and finish things. There are things that we're called to that we are called to finish. And if we're made in His image, that means it's important to God for us to not only start something, but it is more important for us to finish things. It's in our nature. It's who we are. I wrote down, when we are reborn, redeemed, and new creature, creatures in Jesus, that is one of the natures that we take on. That's one of the images we take on. It's one of the characteristic traits that we take on. Paul said, I finished the race, I kept the course, I kept the faith. Paul said that. I can tell you, I was thinking, I was like, I want to finish the race, but I want you to finish the race. What this is about is this is about me and it's about you. Uh, and, and I'm always speaking to myself. But I want you to know that I'm also speaking to you because we're in this together. We're a community. We're family. And so what, what I'm doing and what you are doing is called to do together. And that's how we go forward. And, so, and, and with that, I want to finish well. Like, I want to finish well. And I think that the, 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 the thing well, the word well, um, I think that's subjective. Because well um, can look like one thing, but I think to the Lord, finishing well is just finishing finished. I'm just giving up. Um, I also want to say that I think what I thought finishing well looked very different at different stages of my life. And uh, now that Michelle and I are empty nesters, uh, I think that when you make that shift, there's this, re this realization of like, what now? What is my purpose? What, is, what, what, am I, what are we doing? You know? and, and really begin, what God began to give to me or, or show me is is that finishing well actually isn't about me. It's about the generations to come. It's about my, it's about my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. It's about the lineage and the legacy that follows behind me. And that actually now is the time to even go stronger and harder and even more focused on finishing well because of the impact of who's coming behind me. Yes. And so if that's for me, then that's for you as well. And, and so um, I'm going to try not to get out to the sides too much. Because I have a lot to go through, and I really want to stay on time, and I really want to—I I have a lot to put out there, and I want to make sure I stay in it. So, if I get out here, um, I'll go somewhere different. So I know it's going to try to stay right here, but I want to finish. I just, I just want you to know, I want to finish strong, and I want you to finish strong. I want us to finish strong. And um, Brian Houston, uh, when I'm talking about generations follow, Brian Houston said this. He said, "A lot of things that God has promised you will not happen in your lifetime." but they will happen in your lifeline. Oh, that's good. It is good. That's why he said it. He, it is an incredible sentence. But I got to thinking about that, and really what I got, I got to thinking about is this, is that I'm convinced, uh, how do I read it? I'm convinced the church has lost the promises of the Lord for their life. And I don't say that in judgment or condemnation. What I say is, is that I think that we have created an environment where churches where most everybody is, that's sitting in here will say, um, I have no clue what God's called me to. I don't, I don't know the promises of the Lord for my life. I'm just trying to survive and do the best that I can. And yet we know that the Word says that we are called to have to life and life abundant. That, that means we're not just surviving, but we're thriving. And you thrive in the promises and the call of the Lord. And we survive in the lies of the enemy in the world. And, and I think that the church has become very full of people who are like, well, that's just for the pastor, that's just for the elders, that's just for uh, certain leaders, but I'm just here kind of doing life. And I just want to say that God has called you to things, 
and he's called you to, to do things, to start things, but he's actually called you to finish them to the end. No matter your age, no matter what's going on with you, you are called to things and you're called to finish them. And I told you, I said, we're going to be tackling faith for the next little season. Because I do believe that as we grow and increase faith, it allows you to not only start something that God's called you to, but allows you to finish it. Isaiah 55, 11 says, it is, it, um, it is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit and it will accomplish all I want it to. Right? So when God says a thing, that thing returns to him. Um, some of the versions will say, um, it'll say, uh, it will not return void. I use the version that says fruit, but it, it'll say that my word does not return void. What that saying is, is that his word has value and it doesn't return valueless. It actually returns with value. And, and he's, so what he's saying to us is, I'm going to send things out. I'm going to speak things out into your life, through you, into you. And then I'm going to call them to return there to bear fruit. So, I believe, so I'm saying all that to say because I believe that your life is called to bear fruit. And I believe that us as Encounter Life Ministries, when we do things together, there is much fruit. looking at this, the Lord is like, I want you to go to this passage. And I'm like, oh, Lord, really? That's like the most preached passage there is. And I'm like, you know, I could probably just give someone else's uh, probably message and play it. It would probably be way better than mine. He said, no, no, I want you to dig into it. I want you to look. I want to show you something. And he began to show me some things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you because some of the things that he was showing me, I was like, I've never seen this before. I've never heard it talked about like this before. Um, so we're going to be in Matthew 14. Matthew 14, we're going to start at 22. If you've been in church at any amount of time, you've heard this one. Um, even if you've been there probably once or twice, you've probably heard this passage. It gets used a lot. Here we go. Pick up in verse 22. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble, far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost! But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you, walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus answered. Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? Jesus did not, I, I just I wrote this down. Jesus did not hand Peter a trophy. He did not give him a participation award. He actually rebuked him. And I'm like, it got my attention. I'm like, Lord, why would you rebuke him? So let's pray. Father, we just ask that you would speak to us through your word. Father, reveal your character, your love for us. Grow our faith. Father, we just want to trust in you. Father, we ask that you would deliver us from our doubt and lead us into, Father, these great things that you've called us into. And the things that you've called us into, Father, give us the strength and the courage and the ability to not only begin to start them, but to see them through, to finish them. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we've, we've heard this passage. If you've heard it preached at all, you always get the standpoint of this. Be like Peter. Step out of the boat. No matter, no, doesn't matter what it is. Just have this faith to step out of the boat. 
Don't be like the other disciples. They were bad. Right? They stayed in the boat in fear. But be like Peter. Jump out. And so, as I'm looking at this, some of the challenges I began to look at this is like, I think the real focus, I'm looking at, at what really what Jesus was saying was, don't look at Peter's great faith. I want you to actually see his little faith. Let's address his little faith here. Let's not address that he actually got out of the boat. Yeah? Okay. But what happened when he got out of the boat? His fear kicked in. His doubt kicked in. And, and I know, I think that like you and I, I titled this No Participation Trophies because I think that most of us, we do things just like this. We're like, I'm like Peter, I stepped out. And, and then we, we get in a moment, we're kind of like, ah. And you're looking at God going, where's the trophy? I made an attempt. I tried. Right? And I believe that God's wanted to teach us some lessons about our faith. And how to move from little faith and how to move from doubt into great faith so that we finish what we started, what he has got started with us. And so why, why rebuke Peter uh, for stepping out of the water? Right? Why? Why? I mean, I'm thinking no one's ever done that before. Outside of Jesus doing it at that moment, Peter has been the only person who ever tried it. Why rebuke him? I said that. Um, he's teaching us about faith, and this is what I wrote down. Jesus does not want us to have faith to apprehend. Jesus wants us to have faith to be able to maintain the things that we have laid our hands on. We're good at apprehending. Jesus, say come. Okay. Come. Now what? And fear kicks in. And doubt kicks in. And I believe that God wants to remove his church from just saying, God, if that's you, tell me to come to God. I already know that you've told me and now I'm going to go after it with everything that's inside of me. You placed it in front of me and now I'm going to I'm not going to just apprehend it. I'm going to maintain it to its fullness. Because I believe that uh, Jesus intention was I think his intention was actually for Peter to walk back to the boat and get in the boat with him. I believe that was actually his intention. I do not believe that Jesus' intention was is that he would have a uh, lack of faith and he would have doubt and that he would have to pull him out of the water. I think his intention was is let's go back to the boat together. Okay? The strength to start and finish the call. And we use the word call. And I want to be careful with that word because there's, there's tasks that God puts us on and then there's calling in our life. And the tasks sometimes get confused. And I think that there are moments when God gives you a task to do. And when you jump in, you take this step of faith. I believe I'm called to do that. I believe I'm supposed to do this. And then you jump into it. And like Peter, it gets a little rocky. It gets a little wavy. It gets a little storm kicks up a little bit. And, and we have that doubt. Like, oh, I don't know if I can carry this out. If I can do this. And I, and I think that what God's calling us to is to, to grow our faith so that as he gives you a task or he is calling you into your calling, that you are able to move forward into that, that you're able to carry that out. I know for me, I, I, want, to, I want to finish what God's called me to do. I don't want to get caught up in emotion or hype. And let me, let me explain what I mean by that. So... Many, 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 many years of youth ministry. Lots of youth camps and youth retreats that are phenomenal. Love them. Kids are hyped. Man, when I go back, I am going to do this. I am going to change the world for Jesus. And about three days back in the home life and school, it is like, that would be and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. What I'm saying is, is I think that as a church, what we've done is we've, we've encouraged how to start, but we've not come along and said, we're going to help you finish because God calls us to finish. He's a finisher of things, and so we're a finisher of things. And so I don't say that in condemnation or judgment of things that we've done wrong. I do believe that God's challenged us now to go to the next level and say, you know what? When God calls you into something, we want to encourage you, but I don't want to encourage you 
emotional hype that you're just pumped and excited, but that you are able, like I said, you're not going to just go leave and apprehend it, but that you're actually going to be able to maintain it and see it through to its fullness. Does that make sense? Okay, good. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 7 8 says this finishing is better than starting. I think that's a pretty big word. Finishing is better than starting, and patience is better than pride. I love that. Because there's a lot of times we start things, and it's like people are going to love what I'm doing, and they're going to give me a lot of accolades. They're going to pat me on the back and go, you are so awesome. And But when it doesn't happen right away, when it takes a minute to get there, when it starts getting difficult, when it, when it seems like it's not going to happen, oh, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe God didn't call me to that. And we give up on it. And his word says, finishing is better than starting. Patience is better than pride. Finishing is important to God. I think finishing should become important to us. And a continuation with what we've always heard in this passage is, is don't be like the disciples who sat and did nothing. Don't be like those disciples. And uh, I just want to, I want to challenge you. When Jesus got in the boat, he did not rebuke the disciples for not getting out. He didn't look at them and go, why couldn't you be more like Peter? Look how great his faith was. He stepped out on the water. He, he, didn't, he didn't say anything to them. His rebuke was for Peter. Peter, you took a step. But you had, you lost your faith. You lost why is that? Why, why does that happen? Well, if you look at the passage, Peter says, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come. What happens? Jesus said, come. Who was the word for? The word was for Peter. The, the, the other disciples didn't get the word. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of times, when someone else gets the word, we're operating on their word. And it's not our word for them. It's not our word. And so we go out and we jump out and do something and we go, well, you know, uh, I heard so-and-so was called to do this. and It sounds pretty good. I think I'll jump on board. What, what would happen if the disciples would have gone out on a word that wasn't their word? They would have sunk immediately. Right? It wasn't their call. It wasn't what God had called them to. And, and I think that that's great news because I think a lot of times we feel the pressure to operate or move on someone else's word. And I want to encourage you that God has a word for you, a word, a specific word for you, a place at a time for you that is for you and not for someone else. And his word for someone else is not for you. And we should, as a church and as individuals, should not be operating on someone else's word. That's right. Because that does not empower us to complete and get to the finish. It empowers us to start, to apprehend, but it doesn't empower us to get to the end. Uh, the disciples, it would have been easy for them to go look at Peter and go, well, there goes Peter. And you know he's a little crazy sometimes, but it looks like it's working out for him. We better go. And I think that that's what the church does a lot of times. We see someone start a ministry or they start a call or they start something and it looks kind of good. We're like, I can do that. I can come alongside and do that or I, I can start that type of thing. And we've got to get to where we understand what has God called you to? You've got to get a word from the Lord that is specific to you and not operate on someone else's work. Okay. So, um, you do not have to, I wrote this down, I said, you do not have to live your life out on a word that God did not give you. I feel like that's a scary statement because I think the church has gotten really good at living on other people's word. <coughs> but being frustrated and going from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing because they're looking for something. And I want to encourage you. You don't need to look for something. You need to get a word from God directly to you. And you can. Yes. You can do that. I wrote down. I, I see this is what I, I see this with churches. Okay, So I'm talking about individuals and churches. This is what I see with a lot of churches. That church over there is doing that. It seems to be pretty successful. We should try it. Hey, that looks pretty good. We should try that. 
hey, I think this would make us look really good in the community. We should do this. What we should do as a church is go, what does God say for us as a church, and what is he saying to you as individuals? Right. I don't want to do what some other church is doing. I want to do what God tells us to do. Right. And we're still trying to figure that out. And as I heard, the word said, be patient, because patience is better than pride. I don't want to jump out and try to do something out of pride that makes us look good in the community. I want to do something that has a kingdom impact, and it's because we're operating the word of God, we can see it to the finish. I don't want to be a church, a church that just starts things for the sake of starting things. But however, I do want to be a church that's full of people that have a word for individuals. And that word for the individual individual gets them so passionate that they go, this is the call that God has given me. This is the word that God has given me. I'm ready to go do it. We go, let's go. We'll, we'll come alongside you. Your faith increases the faith of the church. That's why we come together on a regular basis. There are moments when we walk in the door and we go, man, I am really struggling. I need, I need some encouragement. I need some prayers. I need, and then there's other times when we're like, you know what? It seemed like a silly little prayer, but it meant everything to me. Like we need those moments. That's why we come together, right? And so when I talk about, um, when we talk about church doing things that they're called to do, people do not. I don't want to talk about just task. I'm not just talking about ministry. I'm talking about right now, marriage, children, career, hobbies, dreams, whatever the blank is. Yes. All of that. I believe that every person should get a call for their life for that thing. Because whatever that, when they're in that thing, they'll not just be surviving it, they'll be passionate about it. God gave me a word specifically to this area of my life, and I'm pursuing the word that he gave me. I say it that way because I see a lot, I see a lot, and I, over the years, I've talked to a lot of people, and they're comparing themselves to someone else. Like, well, at this age, they were doing this, they had their life together, and I feel like I don't. I'm like, well, that's not your worth. That isn't what God gave you. That isn't what God told you to do. That isn't what God has planned for your life. Don't compare yourself to someone else's timeline. You have your own timeline. You have your own place. You have your own thing, and you've got to find that. And we, we, we are in a culture where we're always comparing ourselves to everybody else and what they have and what they don't have. And the thing about it is most of the culture is miserable trying to pursue things, and we should get pursuing God. That's right. Just God's Word. I just need a word from God. If I have God's Word and I know He's behind it and He's in it, I can do it. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> boy, what you need is a word from God. He has a word for you, a place for you, and a time for you. And you need to respond to his word for your life. You've got to be able to respond to his word. Even if it's like Peter, you do take that one little step, right? I think a lot of times we get, we're like, I don't know, is it a word? I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know. And we, we spend years vacillating and we get to the end and we're like, I should have just made one little step towards it. He has a word for you and he's ready for you to do it. So, um, so let's talk about the importance of calling. I have three things I wrote down. Calling is this, having the wisdom to ask, Jesus, is that you? Peter said, Jesus, is that you? Having the discernment to hear his voice. Remember, waves, storm, lots of noise, lots of things happening. Discernment to hear his voice. Thirdly, having the patience to wait for him to say, come on out. When we read that, we read it as a, a thing of like, um, it was like boop, 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 boop. But you know, there are a lot of times when you're asking the Lord and it isn't like just instantly. There are, I believe there are moments in your life when you're like, Lord, I think you're calling me to something. And, and you go, should I do it? And he's like, it's quiet. <laughs> it's awkward quiet, right? You're like, Lord, just say something. Sometimes the silence is, it's not yet. I didn't call you out yet. I'm about to. I just need your eyes on me. I just need you to say. I just need you to have the wisdom to ask. I need you to have the discernment. God. All right. Does it take a lot of faith to start something? Does it? I mean, you can almost start something without any faith. It takes a lot of faith to finish it. So the, the question I had is, is, um, 
people, it's so easy to start things. But it's not easy to finish them. Why does that happen? Why does that happen? Well, I just, I just said, because a lot of people start on the word that God didn't give them. I want to make sure you get that. I want you to get a word from God and then start on that word, not on someone else's word. To become a culture where we, as we see God call us to things, we're able to finish them. Right? Because if, you're, if you have a call from God, the passion and desire gives you the ability to see it through. And not only to see it through, right? But in moments like this, I wrote down, it says, uh, to see it through things when it's difficult, when your thoughts are like, I thought it would be different, when your thoughts are, where's everybody? It seems like it's just me. I, I thought about that. I was like, what if Peter, Peter was like, he's, he, Lord, is that you? And he's with his disciples and he steps out thinking, well, the rest are going to go with me. They're going to believe in it too. And he takes that step and he's like, why aren't they going? But you know what? There are moments when God calls you to something and you want people to come around you because that validates the call and it, it encourages your passion and it gives you the ability to move forward. But the reality is what if no one goes with you? You've got to be able to rely on the word and know that the word from Lord was that so that you have the passion to see it through when it's just you. When you are called, you can press through. When people abandon you, when they reject you, when it's rough seasons, when it didn't look like you thought it was going to look, when the money isn't there, when the resources aren't there, when all of the things that are in our natural mind and in, in our worldly mind says it's not there, but you go, I'm operating on the word from God and that's enough for me. I can move forward on that. Circumstances are not an indicator that your calling has died. I say it that way because I, 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 in my vision of, of Peter walking out and the faith and the doubt that brought him, it wouldn't be easy for him to go, I made, a, I made a wrong. I know Jesus said, come out here, but I think he was wrong. Looks like I thought Jesus would call him the storm. I thought he would make the waters peaceful and make this easy for me. <coughs> and oh snap, he didn't. And so I must have heard it wrong. So the circumstances have changed my decision. And the circumstances should not change your decision when you get a word from the Lord. God may call you into something else. Uh, let's see, let, me, let me back up in this. Oh, I said. Um, I put on my notes that even when it gets rough, even when it gets rough, it does not mean God's calling you to something else. Right? He's calling you to see it through. Now, there are times when he may call you to something, but he doesn't call you to something else just because it's difficult around you. He may call you to a task that says, I want you to start it, and I'm going to see you finish it. When you finish it, then I'm going to call you, I'm going to give you word to something else. And there are times when he gives you a calling on your life and says, that's my calling I've put on your life. I'll never take that away from you. Let me give you an example. 1 Kings 17. I knew you'd ask, so I wanted to give you one. All right, Elijah. Elijah got a word from the Lord. The Lord said, go to this brook. You'll actually go to this valley. But you go to this valley, and I want you to go to the brook. And when you're there, the ravens, I'm going to have the ravens feed you, and the brook is going to supply, give you your needs for water. I just want you to go there. And he's there. And I don't know if you could imagine what it's like to have ravens feeding you and just dipping your hand in the brook and drinking it, but I can't imagine that. But that's what's happened. And then a famine kicks in, and the brook dries up. I feel like that's a lot of times what it looks like when God calls us to something and we're like, Lord, where are you? What happened? Oh, you must have called me to something new. You must have removed my calling. You must have changed it on me. But that's not what happens because what, what we go on to find out is the Lord said, now go to Zarephath. And he says, I've made a provision for you. Right? So, the brook dried up. But his calling didn't change, right? His, what, are, what am I getting at with this? His season at the brook had ended. He was still a prophet. 
his calling on his life as a prophet was still there. But the task that the Lord had given him to do was done, and now it's time to go over here and do this. And that's why I wanted you to understand there's two different things. You have a calling on your life. There are, there are gifts, spiritual gifts that God has given you to, to, to walk out. And then there are tasks that God has given you to carry out throughout your lifetime to start them and then to finish them. But just because you finish one task and move to the other task does not necessarily mean that your calling has changed. It just means your task at hand has changed. Okay? The Bible says that gifts and the calling are without repentance. Repentance means they're irrevocable. That means he doesn't like do a hide and seek with you with your calling. He doesn't like try to find it. He's like, no, here it is. This is who you are. This is what I've called you to do. This is your calling on your life. This is the gift I've given you. But while you're doing that, I've got some tasks for you to complete as you go. Right? And so just because you do one little thing doesn't mean, doesn't mean it changes the other things. God is drawing God is drawing out the calling of your life. He's drawing out the task and gifts of your life. He's calling those out of you if we allow them to do that. Right? So no matter where you are, God is always calling you and he's calling those things out of you. No matter where you are. It doesn't matter what season you're in, but that's where it is. So, uh, All right, let's read in Acts 20. Acts 20, 22 through 24. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to, this is Paul talking, he says, I'm going to, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Take note of that. When, when God calls you to a task or to go somewhere, there's some hard things ahead of you. There's going to be some things ahead of you. And even though it gets difficult, He wants you to see it through. So, let's read on. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. And I love it. He's so clear. He goes on to explain His task. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. He doesn't say, hey, everybody that's with me, all right, or everybody that's reading this, this is your task. He says, this is my task, and I'm going to make sure I finish it. And you need to find your task, and then you need to declare to yourself, whatever face I face in front of me, whether it's prison or hardships, and like so you're like, I don't want to go to prison or anything. But you know that there are countries where that's happening, right? For the sake of the gospel, there are people facing prison. And right now we're in a culture where we are facing some hardships. Where you cannot speak truth. You cannot speak biblical truth when it comes to biblical principle about whether it's, whether it's life of a baby, whether it's marriage, whether it's gender. If you can't speak truth, we're facing hardships. That's exciting. Right? Sure. Paul states his task, his calling. And I'm going to put two things out of this. this is, I feel like this is what he would have had to say to himself. This is something I need to say to myself. I can't go based on the word that God didn't give me. I have to go based on the word that God did give me. He went because he said, I have to go on the word that was given me. I can't go on anything else. Right? I cannot live my life according to what other people say about my calling. You cannot live your life about what other people say about your calling. Right? I don't get to define for you your calling, and you don't get to define for me my calling. Amen. Right? I don't get to tell you how God's going to use you, and you don't get to tell me how God's going to use me. We have got to get that from God. That's good. And then we've got to operate in that and carry that out. And I, I've seen it. I've seen that happen time and time again. You have to get a word from the Lord. I have to get a word from the Lord. All right. Um, some, I said someone's someone's talent does not define calling. I just want. I just, there's a difference. Okay. There's a difference. I, I we were at a graduation uh, thing yesterday. And it was beautiful, and and parents were you know sharing words with their. Their child in graduating, and and but there was the 
one stood out to me. It was a father who said, you know, as a, a professor of engineering, you know, you would think that I'm going to tell you that you need to engineer your life and you need to do this. And he went the complete opposite. He said, I want you to be like this. I want you to find what your passion is and then do it. And I love that because it would have been easy for him to say, because this works for me, you need to do this. This is, what, this is how you're going to be successful in life. And I love what he was really saying to us. is like, you're going to need to find what God's called you to. And then I want to encourage you to do it. I say that about talent versus calling because Paul talked about this with Apollos. Apollos was the person that traveled with him, and he was a great orator. He was a great speaker. He was very charismatic, and the people loved him because of it. But you know what? Paul's calling led him to writing the vast majority of the New Testament. Apollos had a talent, but it wasn't his calling. You can have talent, but it may not be your calling. You've got to get a word from the Lord so you know the difference. So that you don't seek, you don't put all your identity of a calling from the Lord in your talent. But did you place it in the calling versus talent? God will give you talents for things. But God's going to call you two things. Don't confuse the two. I wrote down, um, people may appear on the outside to be more talented or better suited for something than you. But if you have a calling to do that, they can't get in your way. They can't, they, they can't, they, they, may be, they may look better, but they can't do it at the same that you're going to do it, just like Paul did. God wants to use you, and when he calls you, he will prepare a place for you. Why do I say that? I think there's a lot of times when we go into a place, or we go into something, and someone looks like they are more suited or more talented for something, and we're like, well, God, you called me into this. You need to get them out of the way. And we begin to do things to try to get them out of the way. And I believe that if, if we, we need to do the opposite, is you don't, do, you don't go after the person that's in the place. You allow the Lord to work them out, and actually he's going to move them into their calling, and he's going to move you into your calling. But we don't put ourselves into something because we think that we're like we're supposed to do that. We've got to be patient and allow the Lord to do that. I said it because there's a lot of times um, we'll see someone in a position or a place that we feel like we're called to. And it's like we're waiting for them to fail. And I want you to know that you, they don't have to fail in order for you to succeed. We've got to allow the Lord to do his timing and work things. And I think that a lot of times the problem is is because we're, we so don't know the word that we have from the Lord that the person is in their place based on talent and they haven't caught up to where you are. And you're like, Lord's called me to that. Get out of the way. And the Lord's like, no, wait a minute. I don't want to hurt them. I'm not trying to destroy them. I'm actually just trying to connect them and go, hey, that's, that's a talent you, I've given you, but that's not the word I've given you. I think that what we got to do is help them get into that, right? Don't don't freak out when other people are successful. Don't freak out when someone else gets the job and you didn't. That just means God has something else for you that He has called you to. And I say it that way because there are a lot of times when I'm like, I'll, first someone will be like, I'm just praying for this, and uh, and then it doesn't happen. And then, what do we say? God has something better for me. I feel like that's a prideful statement. I think what you have to say is, is like, that wasn't the word from the Lord. He has something for me. That wasn't it. Right. It's okay to say that wasn't it. It's okay to be disappointed because I thought it was it. But actually what that does is that increases our faith. Because if you're leaning into the Lord and say, oh, Lord, I thought you said do it. I must not have heard. Okay, well, Lord, I need, you know what? I've got to dig in deeper. I've got to, I've got to like get closer. I've got to build a relationship with you. I need to be able to hear your voice because when the wind and the storm's going on and I think I'm hearing your voice and I didn't and I missed it, now I'm walking in disappointment and, and, and uh, frustration and I don't want to walk in that. I want to walk in your calling because there's peace in your calling. Right? right? So, not that you can't say God has something better for me. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that because um, it, it almost insinuates it's like well I didn't really want that after all I really didn't want it at all God was calling me to it I was going to have to do it right 
Like that's actually not the call in your life. The call is if you feel God calls you into something, you pursue it. And if he shuts the door, you go, okay, well, Lord, that wasn't it. That wasn't it. But I'm willing to do whatever it is. And it will be be and it actually will be better because when God's in it, it's great. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it's not difficult, it just means it's great. Alright. So um, you don't need courage to take risk. You don't need courage to take risk. What do you need? You need the wisdom to ask, is it you? The discernment to recognize it's Jesus, and the patience to wait for his word. Same thing I said earlier, I just worded a little bit different, right? Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. We hear the first part, but I think we miss the second part. It is important to know Jesus' voice, because you know what? There are a lot of strangers around you that will mislead you. There are a lot of voices vying for your attention. There are a lot of loud noises that are vying for your attention to make sure that you don't hear the voice of the Lord. They want to make sure you don't get a word from God. Those voices want to make sure, the enemy wants to make sure that you are wandering around, half fallen in the water, in, in lack of faith and doubt. Because if I can keep you there, I, can't, I can make sure that you don't finish what God's called you to. And you can only do that when you know the voice of the Lord. I'm going to say this to you. Look, every single person in here, anybody's watching on, you have to hear from the Lord. You yourself have to get a word from the Lord. It is important for you. You have to know the voice of the Lord. It is important for you to know the voice, to discern His voice from all the other voices. It is vital for you and for the church and for the gospel of Jesus Christ for you to know His voice. You are His sheep. It's not just pastors. It's not just elders. It's not just in leadership. It is every single one of you who calls on the name of Jesus you must know his voice. You are his sheep. I thought you'd get a lot more excited about that. <clears throat> I, I, there's been moments where I've had people say, you know, say, uh, this so-and-so, and I'm not picking on pastors or preachers, or, but like, you know, it will be a moment where I'll be talking to someone like, well, he said for me to do this, and I'm like, that's not God. They're like, well, how do you know this? Because I know the voice of the Lord. He wouldn't say something like that. <laughs> Where someone takes a, a text of the Bible and twists it to manipulate to get someone to do what they want them to do. Right. To put a to put to place a call on their life that isn't there. And some of you are like, is that me? And, I'm, and that's what I want to get. I, my goal, my belief is the Lord wants to get us to the point where you don't doubt and you go, no, I know, I know the Lord's voice, and I know that He said, go. I also know that he said, don't go. He said, wait, hold up. Because that's the voice that goes around all the time. I'm calling you, I, I think that the Lord is saying, I'm calling you to recognize that is me and that is not me. I'm in that and I'm not in that. I'm calling you to this and I'm not calling you to that. Calling is what you need. A word from the Lord is what you need. Um, I love this statement. This is uh, People will say, I just need to get peace about it. I just need to get peace about it. Um, you don't need peace. You need a word. If you look at Peter, what, what happened when Peter got a word? The whole thing, I mean, it all broke apart, right? The waves picked up. The wind increased. And how often do we go into a situation where we feel God called us and we're like, I just need peace. And he's like, you don't need peace. You just need to operate on my word. Right? right? <laughs> Peter didn't walk on water. He walked on the word. And some of you are like, no, he walked on water. His calling was to walk on the water, to walk out. Yes, he physically walked on water, but what he was walk walking on was the word that God gave him. That's what gave him the, the ability to move forward, right? Everything fell apart. And that's what happens to us. We get a word from the Lord, we walk out, and the storm erupts. And we're like, but I thought you, but Lord, you're in it. It should be peaceful. You're peaceful. Well, actually, 
His peace comes in knowing that he will see you through the storm because you're going to finish it. A lot of times we don't get, we don't allow the peace to actually come into our life because we don't see it through to the end. We're like, well, it got difficult. I must have misunderstood. I must have, must have, I must have missed it. I must have, I mean, you know, it should be peaceful. If the Lord calls you to it, it's just going to be like rainbows and unicorns. And, and I think, I really believe that it, there are moments when it is like that, but I think that most of the time it's really, the Lord says, you know what? My word tells you over and over that when you take a step of faith, there's going to be a, there's going to be resistance going to come against you. The devil, the devil's going to come against you. The enemy's going to come against you. The world's going to come against you. But I don't want you to just start it. I want you to finish it. Right? We look at those, uh, right? The ones who got the different talents. They started something and they finished it. Except for the one who, who didn't even start and he didn't finish. The other one's took it, they started it, and they finished it, and he said, now I can trust you with a little, I can give you more, and we go around going, Lord, why don't you use me for something? He's like, I can, I can barely get you to start something. I just need you to finish something. Can we do that? Let's just try one thing. It's going to be difficult, but I'm in it with you, and when we get to the end, you're going to feel the peace. And when I can trust you with something, I can trust you with more. Well, I thought we'd be excited about that one, too, but... <laughs> All right, you don't need peace about it. Sometimes the will of God looks like chaos, wind blowing, a difficult situation, and it appears to look like there isn't a way. And I just want to, I just want to encourage you that Jesus doesn't need to find a way; He makes a way out of no way. That's right. That's right. I, you got to hold on to that word. We, like we're always, we're looking for the find the way, find the way. I mean, Jesus, you make a way when there is no way. I'm going to work. I'm going to live on that. One. I'm going to operate with that one. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to encourage you as, as you move forward. I don't. I would encourage you not to look at something and go, "What? Well, I have peace about it." I want you to say, "I have a word about it." I got a word about it, and that gives me peace because I know God's in it, and that means you have to know His voice. Um, I was thinking about when you know when when we when ELM launched. Um, I will tell you that uh, Michelle and I did not have peace, but we knew we had a word from the Lord. I, I think even now we're still like, I mean, I, I'm saying that in all honesty, like it was like, man, Lord, I don't know. But I'm going to tell you every single day for me it is, Lord, you gave us a word and we're going to see it through. We're going to, you know what, if everybody leaves, we're going to continue to do it. If everybody abandons, we're going to continue to do We're going to operate on that word that you gave us. And I don't know what it looks like, and I, I'm not going to worry about what it looks like, because I know that, that you said that you'll make a way, and we're going to continue to do that. So, out of the comfort and into the unknown, really, is what I wrote down. So, we jump out of the comfort and into the unknown. And that's what a word from the Lord is, is jumping out of our comfort and into the unknown. And some of you were like, I didn't sign up for that at all. But you did. You said yes. You said yes to Jesus. And I want to encourage us. That's what the church has got to start doing. We've got to start getting to that. And i got to move on. So um, the reason why I say that is because when you get a word from the Lord, um, it'll keep you where feelings won't keep you. A word will keep you where the results, when the results don't line up. You know, a, a word will keep you, right? Because man does not live by bread alone, but he lives by every word. So when things don't add up, you go, the word from the Lord will keep me, will sustain me through this. Faith tells me that this is the assurance, the confidence, the confidence. I don't know the full outcome, but my faith in the word that God gave me gives me the assurance and the confidence to see it through to the end. Greater risk is to not do what God said than to do what God said. God loves obedience. I should probably say that again because some of you are like, the greater risk is to not do what God said than it is to do what God said. I say it that way because a lot of times they're like, I'm going to risk it all for Jesus. I just want to tell you that you are not risking anything. Jesus risked it all on the cross. He already did it. He already risked it for you. Actually, what you're doing is you're going, I'm going to be obedient to the word God gave me. 
You're not taking a risk. You're walking in obedience. Yeah, it's unknown what it's going to look like, right? Jesus risked it all. When you put your confidence in Jesus, you are putting your confidence in someone who risked it all. And he will come through every single time. And I think some of you are like, yeah, but there was this moment where he didn't come through. Your come through and his come through look different. Yeah. And when you get a word from the Lord in every situation, God can give you a word in a situation where you're like, I don't really like the outcome, but I trust you. I'm okay with that, Lord. I'm okay with this. And so... I wrote down all these years. All these words I've been looking at is like Peter. It's like, and I said this earlier, right? I'm like, look at how he got out of the boat. And I was thinking about this. This is what he should have got. Walked on water. <laughs> right? That's what we all want. That's what we all, that's what we're, that's what we do a lot of times. When we say I'm going to risk it for Jesus, I'm going to do this because I'm looking for this. Jesus said, you don't need this. Peter, let's talk for a minute. You had such little faith, and why did you have doubt? And I think there are moments when you jump into something, you feel like it's a call from God, and you step out of faith, and the storm gets a little rough. I want you to get your eyes off the, the trophy. I want you to get your eyes off of this. And I want you to get your eyes on, okay, Lord, talk to me and be honest. I, I lacked faith, didn't I? I, I had doubt, didn't I? Yeah, I know. Okay. All right. Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to lean on your word. I'm not doing this to get this. Because this doesn't satisfy. This doesn't bring satisfaction. This doesn't bring wholeness. This doesn't bring completeness. It makes me look good to people. But if I lacked faith in your eyes, that means I'm still growing. That means I've still got places to go, get to. And you're trying to get me. And so I think that we should leave this blank and put it to the side and go, Lord, what are you calling me to? Because he's not calling you to get participation trophies. He's calling you to complete tasks for him. He's calling you to walk in your calling and your gifting. And he's calling you to have kingdom impact on people's lives where not only is there salvation, but where they begin to walk in a life of abundance of peace and joy and hope and happiness and faith and love and contentment and discipline and self-control. And that comes by us saying, Lord gave me a word for this moment in time and I'm going to see it through and I'm going to see how it have impact on people's lives. That's the stuff that's the trophies that I'm storing up in heaven. And I don't know about you, I don't know what heaven's going to look like, but I think that as we are able to finish the thing God calls us to, there's going to be a whole lot of trophies in a trophy case in, our, in my house. And it's going to remind me of all the times that my faith and my, my trust in God's word carried me through. It's going to remind me. It's not going to remind me of what, how great I was and what I did. It's going to remind me of how good God was. And then he kept growing me in faith. He kept growing me in faith. And he said, I'm not giving you a participation award because that's not enough. I'm going to give you moments where you're going to step out on the water and I'm going to go to you. Why did you struggle with faith? Why did you doubt me? I told you I'll see you through to the end. your eyes. I'm going to have the worship team come up. I would have you ask yourself or am I ready to move to my calling? Am I ready to move into hearing your voice? As your eyes are closed, maybe there's someone in here, or maybe there's someone online. That you may not know the voice of God because you've never let Jesus into your 
life. You've never said yes to Jesus Christ. You've never made Him Lord of your life. And you're like, man, there's a lot of storms and a lot of things around me that are going on. I understand what you're saying, Pastor, that Jesus calling me doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be super easy, but I, I think that I would like the peace of Jesus and I'd like to walk in and operate on hearing the voice of God. And if that's you, if you, you're like, man, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to start a relationship with Jesus. I want to start walking in faith. And I want to see things happen with my life that only God can do. If that's you, all eyes are closed. But if that's you, and you want to raise your hand. Someone will come to you and pray with you, walk you through salvation, prayer. If you're online, you can message us. And we would love to pray with you. But as your eyes are closed and you're talking to the Lord, perhaps you would say, man, I've been a Christian for a short amount of time. I've been a Christian for a long time. And I don't know that I, I, don't know that I recognize the Lord's voice. And I so desperately want to know the Lord's voice versus my voice and my friend's voice and my enemy's voice and the devil's voice and work's voice and everybody else's voice. And you would want someone just to pray with you. There's no, there's not a special thing about that. It just, it would just be an agreement that that you can hear the Lord's voice. You can get a word for your life. You can get a word for your calling. The Lord does want to give you a word. And if that's you, you want someone to just pray with you. I, I want to encourage you right now. This is a safe place. Raise your hand, and someone will come to you and they'll pray with you and just encourage you. Drives your clothes, and the worship team is gonna just gonna sing. Over, they're gonna sing over you. Feel free to stand and worship when when you feel it's time. But I would ask you just to take a moment to talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to get a word from you. I, I want to be confident. I want to be confident in what you're speaking and saying. And I don't want the enemy to twist anything, twist truth. But I want to be able to operate on that word. I think some of you have been given a word from the Lord and you've been making every excuse under the sun why not to take a step of faith. And I'm challenging you right now. Even if you've got a little bit of doubt, you still need to take a step. The word that was given to you, that is. And some of you are maybe, man, I, I thought I got a word, but I didn't. Lord, would you give me a word? I'm ready for that. was praying about or, or speaking today about hearing the voice of the Lord and being obedient to, to finish what you begin. And so we're not finished quite yet. There's a couple things to do still. So I appreciate you bearing with us. What did you want to be with that here? Um, when the Lord gives you work, you need to be faithful to get it, right? <laughs> All right, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly and share with you something that the Lord has shared with me over the last couple of days, but kind of took it ties into what Corey is saying here. The other day, Amy and I were at work, and up to about 2.15, we had not seen one person with skin on them. Nobody. Not, a, not no dime, not nothing. And yet I was sitting there, and I was writing out orders, and I was spending in writing these orders hundreds of dollars, and I wasn't seeing not one penny coming in. I wasn't seeing anybody with skin on them. And I told the Lord, I said, you know what, I'm just going to close up and go home. There's not even a need for me to be here. And that was about 2.15. At 2.20, here come three women. I kid you not, these women bought two pieces of candy for $1.25. Mm -hmm. 
each of them. The first woman did it, and she bought a honey dipper for $3.99. Well, when one woman did it, then the next woman decided she needed two pieces of candy and a honey dipper, and the next woman did too. So that's the sales that I had. But it was little, and the Lord was saying to me, you know, I have you here for a reason, but I'll give you a piece of candy. Okay, so at the end of that day, I was kind of tired. I had been working, and I know Jerry was mowing the yard up at the graveyard somewhere, and he wouldn't want to grill out or cook or nothing. So I went by IGA. Now, this is where it gets important. I went by IJ and I went over to the deli to get some chicken, and I couldn't get the guy's attention. And I'm walking over here, and he wasn't paying any attention to me. I was walking over here, and there was no bell. You know, like you can ring a bell for service, none of that was there. And so then I went back over this way again, I went back over that way, and I thought, forget the chicken, you know, I'll just make a hamburger or something. I went back, and there he was. And he said, can I help you? And I said, I want to get the eight-piece bucket of chicken. Well, in a minute, this woman came up to me, came up to here, and she said, look at this spread that is laid out here for you. All this food here, nobody here but just you. This spread is for you. And I looked at her and I said, that's right, because I'm a child of the king. I'm a princess. And she said, that's right, you are. And who that person was was Dee Dee. <laughs> Dee Dee back here. So we're still in there talking about who I am in the Lord. And the man said, okay, you know, what do you want? He said, there's no breast. And I'm standing there looking at one. I was recognizing the breast. So was Dee Dee. But the man did not see the breast. And I said, it's right there. He did not know what was in front of him. He did not recognize the identity of that piece of chicken. And I did. And he said, well, there's no more. I said, yeah, there is. And that's right, Dee Dee. Yeah. I said, there's no one right there. And he got it. And Dee Dee said, I could say something, but I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> now, what she was going to say, I don't know, but my mind went to wandering up some things. <laughs> but this man did not recognize the pieces of chicken in front of him. So she said goodbye, and I said goodbye. She went on her way, and I went on my way. Then I got to thinking about how we do not know who we are. And we sometimes don't recognize who somebody else is and their positioning. Then my mind went to the Lion King. Rafiki. Or whatever his name is. A monkey. <laughs> that was in the Lion King. Simba was going off doing his thing and he wasn't, he wasn't walking or operating in who he was, which was the child of the king of everything. Mufasa. Okay, he runs off. And then this monkey comes to him and he says, do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? And the monkey was, was on him and Simba is a little kid, little lion, cub, whatever you call him, he had grown up some. He was looking in the water, but in the water, what he saw was Mufasa, the reflection of his father. He was made in the image of his father, was what manifested in the water. We don't know who we are, and that's why you don't know the voice of the Lord when you hear it. Mufasa started, Mufasa started speaking to Simba from in the air. He didn't see Mufasa. He heard his voice, and he said something like Simba got to go back to the home pride and be what you're supposed to be and be what you're supposed to be, whatever it was. But he was talking to him, but he couldn't see him. And that's how it is with us in the voice of the Lord. It's a, it was like I was saying to someone earlier, it is a step-by-step, -step. it's an ongoing thing that you do. You don't just wake up one morning and say, oh, that was God's voice. It's like you have to exercise that. And as you know the Word of God, you can test those voices against what the Word says. The Word, the, the voice, the Lord is not going to say, go and, and steal $10 from somebody. When you know that the Word says, thou shalt not steal. You can check that voice by the Word of God. And you exercise it. Have conversations with God that only you and God would know in here. In here, because you have the power of life and death in your tongue. And when you open up your mouth and you speak it, Satan hears it. And that's when these voices are going to come and try to talk to you because you're given a subject matter for the enemy to hear. 
Have private conversations with the Father in your head that only He and you know. And then you check that so that you know it's not your thought process against the Word of God to see if it matches up to the Word. And as you do it time by time and time, you'll get better at it. You'll miss it. There'll be times you'll miss it. And that's okay. There'll be times you miss it. But look at the reflection of who you are. You're made in the image of God. And you can hear your Father's voice. And Praise know God what a piece that. of chicken is. Praise God for that. <laughs> Got one more person wants to share something. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Just when you thought you'd go to lunch, too bad. So, um, this is going to be a little longer than one. Two months ago, this started? Has it been two months? Okay, so, two months ago, I woke up, uh, messed up shoulder. I don't know how you sleep for yourself, but I pulled it off. <laughs> Three days after that, the knees, well, I woke up with a swollen knee, and within a day or two, an old spinal injury had come back. In a week and a half, that doctor said that the original surgery didn't fix it, and that we would have to go back in. For him to go back in, I have to quit smoking or he won't do it. We'll see where the Lord takes me on that. But this morning, I have been limping for it got worse the last few days, but I've been limping for a couple of weeks because if I don't limp, things in me are popping in different places in about the fourth or fifth step. I'll either get a burning pain or I'll get a shoot. I would love to tell you that all the pain is gone. I wish I could give God that glory. All I can tell you is that I am moving my shoulder like this. And that it's been really I'm not having any stamp, uh, stabbing pains that I was having, just some aches. And if you're doing this slow, I'm okay with that. The neck, I can I can feel something, but this is the less, the least amount of pain I have had in two months. So this is better than I. Have. I don't I don't know why God chooses to heal sometimes and why He chooses not to other times. I know for two months, my time with God is always in the morning. That's the time when I've been able to get the closest. That's also the time where my pain has been the worst. So for two months, I can't pick up my phone and freely move it. I can't sit in one spot. So getting into the Word, I haven't really been able to do. I haven't really been able to concentrate. About the last five days, I got fed up with not being able to do it. And I started figuring out how to just ignore some of the pain and be with God. And he, he showed me through some tears and eyes and some peace and joy in my heart. He's been there the whole time. I just needed to look past what I was going through. So I don't know how this sounds to you, but if he wants to leave me in pain so that I can learn to walk with him through distraction, I hope he leaves me in pain because I'll get something out of that. I will grow closer, closer to God. If he decides to heal me, he's a powerful God. I appreciate everything and, and pray that he gets all the glory he deserves. He's healed me before. I know he has the power to do it. So I'm going to ask that you all pray on whatever I'm going to do on this smoking thing. So if surgery, surgery needs to happen, it can happen. But I also want you to Give glory to God because what he did this morning through that prayer, if that's all I got, I got two hours of a whole lot less pain than what I've done. And that's a lot of good for me. So thank you. Okay, so the word was, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. I think Corey had that in his message and uh, you know, it's funny how it works. So we're just praying that. Lord, more, more, more. Worship team, we thank you. You guys are really good. Yeah.
we don't know how blessed we are until you go somewhere else and find out how blessed you are. So just take take in everything that God wants to impart to you. So Lord, we just bless the, the moms today. We bless the women that are uh, walking and working and, and helping with, with life. And we ask you, Lord, to speak to us this week. I'm praying for every one of you, every one of us. Speak to us that we would hear. And help us, Lord, to get a hold of the word, but not just to begin something, but to press in, press on, press through to finish what it is you're speaking to us to do. And we say yes to you this morning and ask you, Lord, to be with us and be honest and move through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.